Okay, so in this next video, what I want to discuss is firstly the potential mechanism that has been suggested for how presynaptic, um, presynaptic long-term potentiation can happen. And then what I want to discuss is an experiment demonstrating uh, at least something about postsynaptic um, long-term potentiation. Okay, so we've seen that the major thing that causes long-term potentiation is that if you release glutamate uh, from the axon terminal onto this dendritic spine, and that release of glutamate is coupled to an action potential, what actually happens is that the NMDA receptors actually conduct in those situations. So if you just release glutamate with no uh, action potential, then the NMDA receptors are basically blocked by magnesium because the electrical potential difference across the cell membrane is too negative and that's pulling the magnesium into the pore basically. So uh, that is how you uh, basically measure this coincidence and that's an important concept actually that the NMDA receptor is effectively acting as a coincidence measurer. So basically it, it becomes active not only it, to become active to actually conduct it needs not only glutamate from the, uh, from the uh, axon terminal, but it also needs an action potential across the cell membrane of the dendritic spine. So it's a coincidence detector, really. And uh, basically, when those two are coupled, it uh, conducts calcium into the cell, and that calcium is then going to lead to the strengthening of this synapse, basically. Okay, so... Um, one of the um, mechanisms that has been suggested for how this rising calcium in the dendritic spine can lead to a change presynaptically is that basically calcium activates the enzyme NNOS, uh, standing for neuronal nitric oxide synthase. So NNOS uh, is an enzyme within the cytoplasm of the dendritic spine, and it stands for neuronal neuronal uh, nitric oxide synthase. Nitric oxide synthase. And what this enzyme does is it synthesizes nitric oxide. So it's a nice sensibly named enzyme. So basically this enzyme creates you nitric oxide. Now nitric oxide is an incredibly um, soluble molecule. So uh, basically it will diffuse straight out of the cell, uh, out of the dendritic spine, and it will diffuse back to this axon terminal here. And that was the big thing that uh, people couldn't understand. How could a rise in calcium here um, cause a change presynaptically? You would need something known as a retrograde messenger, something that was going to go back, some, some molecule that was going to be sent back from the uh, postsynaptic cell to the presynaptic cell, and nitric oxide has been suggested to be this presynaptic messenger. As I say, there is, it's not been proved to be the presynaptic messenger, as this retrograde messenger, sorry, uh, but it's a suggested theory. Uh, so this, this, this might be completely wrong, uh, but it's a suggestion for how uh, this calcium going up here is going to affect this presynaptic cell. And rather unsatisfyingly, this diagram ends there. It ends with nitric oxide going to this presynaptic cell, and somehow that is supposed to cause uh, the amount of glutamate that's being released uh, to go up. So it's somehow going to have to cause the number of glutamatergic vesicles that are going to be released upon each action potential to go up. So glutamate release is supposed to go up in response to nitric oxide. I can't tell you any more than that because there's no more known as far as I know. Okay, but there is at least a suggestion for a retrograde messenger that may well send this message back from the postsynaptic cell to the presynaptic cell to cause presynaptic changes. And what is that presynaptic change? Well, it's that the amount of glutamate that each uh, that this axon terminal is going to release upon uh, you know upon being signaled by an action potential is going to be greater. Okay, so now let's talk about this postsynaptic mechanism. So, and as I say, in my opinion, probably both of them are used to strengthen this synapse and cause long-term potentiation. Uh, but as at the moment, the jury is out uh, with regards to the truth of this uh, mechanism. Okay, so I'm going to talk about an experiment uh, involving postsynaptic 
mechanisms. So the supposed postsynaptic change is that when the calcium goes up, which indicates that you know that this that these two things have happened at once, that this axon terminal here has released glutamate and that an action potential has fired, calcium goes up in response to that because of the NMDA receptors. That calcium then needs to somehow lead to more AMPA receptors being expressed in the membrane. And um, again, the mechanism by which it does that is not known, but there is a nice experiment which I'd like to um, talk about, uh, which can show that all you need is um, a free pool of AMPA receptors. You don't actually need genes. So we don't believe that calcium uh, is going and causing changes on the genetic level. We don't believe it's changing the expression of AMPA receptors. Instead, we think that what it's doing is acting on, um, acting maybe on vesicles in the cytoplasm, which might contain AMPA receptors. So maybe there's an AMPA receptor here, though those of them loaded in vesicles, but not in the cell membrane. And basically, it appears that calcium might cause those to be inserted into the cell membrane. So it appears that it doesn't affect the genes, but instead it, um, it's just causing uh, AMPA receptors that you've already made, but aren't actually within the uh, membrane of the postsynaptic, well, not actually within this postsynaptic membrane to be inserted into the membrane, basically. We, okay, so I'll discuss the experiment that suggests this. Okay, so a clean piece of paper. All right. Okay, so basically what they did is they went to a cell line and they went to the DNA. So they went to a cell and they looked at the DNA and they went to absolutely every single gene which codes for an AMPA receptor. So there are loads of different types of AMPA receptor subunits and there are, um, and every cell will have uh, two chromosomes which each have a copy of those genes. So basically they went to absolutely every single gene which codes for an AMPA receptor subunit. So let's say this here is a gene encoding for an AMPA receptor subunit. So this is an AMPA receptor subunit. Okay, and what they basically inserted in is they inserted certain pieces of DNA uh, in before each of these genes. So this is an AMPA receptor subunit gene. And basically what they did is they inserted in, so let me get some colours to denote this. So this is the AMPA receptor gene here. And basically on either side of uh, the um, AMPA receptor genes, and they did this for absolutely every single AMPA receptor subunit gene, they insert in two DNA sequences called the um, LOXP gene. Lox P sequence. Okay, right. So this is the Lox P sequence. So it's a certain combination of organic bases, basically. It's just a strip of DNA, but basically it is the strip of DNA which is recognized by a certain recombinase enzyme. Okay, right. So they created these cells where absolutely every single one of the AMPA receptor subunit genes have the, is flanked, basically, by these LOXP sites, okay? Right, what they also did is they uh, put in a gene coding for the Cree recombinase with a progesterone, so the Cree P recombinase enzyme. Okay, so let me explain what this is. So basically, you have an enzyme. There is an enzyme known as Cree recombinase. So let's say this is Cree recombinase. And basically what Cree recombinase does is uh, that it goes to sites on DNA like LOXP and basically it cuts them out. So this Cree recombinase would go to all of these AMPA receptor subunits, it would go to the flanking LOXP regions, it would cut them and it would cut out basically all of the AMPA receptor subunit genes. So you can see why this might be useful in our experiment to try and show that uh, you don't actually need AMPA receptor subunit genes in your neuron in order to get long-term potentiation. Okay, now we want to try and have our Cree recombinase cutting out the AMPA receptors um, when we want, basically. So 
the important thing to understand is that if you have a neuron here, let's say this is a neuron, what we could do is we could try and just destroy the AMPA, re AMPA receptor subunit genes from, from the birth of this cell, basically. So we could try and completely just destroy the AMPA receptor genes from birth, but that's not what we want to do, because if we destroy them from birth, then the, gene, then the cell won't have any AMPA receptors in, is the problem. And then, you know, there won't be any glutamatergic um, conductance. We still want glutamate to be, we still want uh, AMPA receptors to be within the dendritic spines so that we do get all of that stuff happening in the dendritic spines. It's just we want to destroy the AMPA receptors uh, so, that, um, so that we know that when long-term potentiation happens, it's not going to the nucleus and activating the production of more AMPA receptors. So think what we're trying to test. We are trying to test whether long-term potentiation actually causes more AMPA receptor subunits to be produced. We're not going to be able to observe long-term potentiation if we've got a cell that actually has no AMPA receptors and has had no AMPA receptors subunits from birth. Okay, so instead what we need is to be able to destroy the AMPA receptors, just uh, subunit genes, just before we do the experiment. And that's what this Cre recombinase with the progesterone receptor is going to do. So what we do is we attach onto this Cre recombinase a progesterone receptor. And basically we put in the gene for this Cre recombinase with this progesterone receptor into the DNA of this neuron. Okay, and basically what happens is that the neuron produces Cre recombinase with a progesterone receptor, but the progesterone receptor stops the Cre recombinase from working, basically. So the Cre recombinase does not actually cut out your AMPA receptor subunit genes yet. So the cell has all of its AMPA receptor subunit genes perfectly intact at the moment. It's making this Cre recombinase with the progesterone receptor. Um, and the progesterone receptor is stopping the Cre recombinase from actually functioning, so you're keeping your AMPA receptors. That means that in the dendritic spines, this neuron will be completely normal. It will have AMPA receptors in its dendritic spines, and we will be able to perform uh, the long-term potentiation experiment. Okay, now, what we then do is we, just before we're about to do this experiment, uh, so this is the, just to label what this was, this was the Cre recombinase with the progesterone receptor gene. Okay, just before we do the experiment, what we do is we are going to activate the Cre recombinase so that it destroys all the AMPA receptor genes, so that the AMPA that you've made in this neuron so far is all the AMPA that this neuron's going to have forevermore now. It's never going to be able to make any more. Okay, so what we then do is we activate this Cre recombinase with the progesterone receptor. And the way that we activate it is using the drug mifepristone. 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 And basically, mifepristone is a progesterone receptor antagonist. It's quite an infamous drug because... Um, because it's used, um, it's used as an abortion. Uh, it's used to trigger abortion, basically. It binds to progesterone receptors and stops progesterone from being able to bind. So it's going to bind to this progesterone receptor and basically stop progesterone from being able to bind. That inactivates the progesterone receptor, and that means that the Cre recombinase, which was being inhibited by the progesterone receptor, is now active. So mifepristone also has another famous name, which is RU486, and I believe there's actually a song named after this drug, which is called like RU486. It might be a fun YouTube venture for you. Um, okay, so mifepristone um, is going to activate our Cre recombinase. So we douse our neuron in mifepristone, and basically Cre recombinase is now going to go and cut out all of our AMPA genes. So we now have a neuron that has no AMPA receptor uh, subunit genes in it. So it cannot make any more AMPA receptor. Now, what we do is we use viruses. So let's say this is a virus. And basically what we do is we stuff the virus full of AMPA receptors. So this is a virus full of AMPA receptors. Okay, so it's a, it's a package full of AMPA receptors, okay? 
And basically what we do is we infect the cell with this virus, which is full of AMPA receptors. And this virus goes into the cell and dumps the AMPA receptors within the cell. And basically what we find is that when we do the long-term potentiation experiments, um, long-term potentiation happens perfectly all right, i.e. Uh, if the postsynaptic uh, theory is right, i.e. if um, when calcium goes up, that does caught in, in the intracellular compartment, so um, let me just rem remind you of long-term potentiation. So basically, if this is the uh, dendritic spine, then what happens is if glutamate happen, if glutamate is released by the axon terminal at the same time as this dendritic spine is undergoing an action potential, then uh, basically the NMDA receptors actually start conducting because the glutamate causes them to open and the uh, action potential across the cell depolarizes the cell membrane and that removes the magnesium block. So finally, this NMDA receptor opens, that allows calcium into the cell, and this opening of the NMDA receptor, well, this conducting by the NMDA receptor, because it's open when glutamate binds, even though it's got the magnesium block, uh, but this conductance through the NMDA receptor of calcium, and calcium going up, that then shows this postsynaptic cell that you have had this coincidence happen, i.e. the axon terminal was active when the action potential was happening as well, and then calcium is going to lead, at least what we hypothesize is that it leads to more AMPA receptors in the postsynaptic membrane. And you find basically that if you've given this virus full of AMPA receptors, you still get long-term potentiation of this synapse. So basically, you do not need the AMPA receptor subunit genes, basically. Tree recombinase has destroyed them all. You do not need them. What you need is a free pool of AMPA receptors. So if there is postsynaptic modification of the dendritic spine uh, to cause a strengthening of the synapse, then it isn't at the level of the nucleus, basically. You don't make more AMPA subunits. You're using AMPA subunits that are already in uh, the cytoplasm.